So we did a campaign to pressure everyone, including Bernie Sanders, but specifically Bernie Sanders, to introduce fifteen dollars minimum wage as part of the bill. He wound up introducing it as an amendment. The campaign that we did was hashtag Don't Kill It Bernie, and and if he had not introduced it even as an amendment, they never would have even voted on it. So. We think that it was a pretty good success because now we know the eight Democratic senators who voted against it, and that is very helpful to us eventually winning on this. Apparently, they talked about it on CNN, and we want to show you that clip and then react to it. Look, you got to give Bernie Sanders a lot of credit. He has a progressive base, and there's a and the progressive base is a big part of this party. You know, you have the Young Turks and a bunch of other progressive forces saying, if we're not going to fight now. Uh, this is the one chance, this is a must pass bill, you've got to pass it. This is the time to fight for our values. If we're not going to fight now, and if we're going to preemptively surrender, don't even take the vote. Why did we just kill ourselves in November and then in January to get the majority and to put that gavel in the hands of Democrats? So I think uh, you know you can have sympathy for everybody in this thing. But Bernie Sanders, uh, you know who he is, you know what he stands for. When he was given that gavel, you should expect him to use it for progressive causes, and he did. Uh, The big problem that I think we have is this this is suicide for the Democratic Party uh, to try to go into a midterm election here in about 20 minutes. Uh, not in danger of not delivering on stuff that people went out and voted for uh, in terms of a big COVID relief bill uh, in terms of a minimum wage increase. And so, uh, listen, we have a big party. Uh, it goes from, from Bernie to Manchin. Both of them um, have challenges. But Manchin is the one who has the opportunity to do a, reason, a reasonable deal and get this thing done. So I, I loved every part of that. Um, and so if Van is right about the surrender, and there are three components of that surrender. So in the beginning, it looked like we weren't even going to get a vote on it. In which case, all the Democrats who were opposed to it would have gotten a chance to hide and pretend that they were in favor of the things that they promised on the campaign trail, when in reality they were not in favor of it. Well, now they're exposed, and that's why we have the next petition: tytcom slash petitions slash the hateful eight. Okay, so that's the eight Democrats that voted with Mitch McConnell. Ted Cruz and all the Republicans to kill an increase in minimum wage. So, um, but there's other layers to the surrender. Uh, if Kamala Harris had come in as the presiding chair of the Senate and said, "No, this does go into reconcil, it does go into the bill through reconciliation," which she had sole authority to do. Um, well, it, then a filibuster couldn't have ended. This procedure, procedure, right? She chose not to do that. Instead, Schumer put in a presiding chair that said, "Oh yes, again, we agree with Mitch McConnell and the Republicans that this should not go through go through reconciliation. It should be much harder to do." Golly gee, I wonder why the Democrats want it to be harder because they're not actually in favor of it. And then they take the vote, and you find out, yeah, we were right. Eight of them agree with Republicans, and so. And then the last part of the surrender, guys, is the toughest one of all. The Democrats could still block this bill. It's as we speak now, it's not over. They could just one Democratic senator or just six Democratic Congress people can say no. If Manchin's going to say no, we say no. He says yes, we say yes. And I call it the Manchin rule, but obviously it applies to those eight senators overall. It applies to Krista Cinema and her theatrics. Uh, around voting no, it applies to all of them. If you guys want to use your power and say no, we're voting no on this. Okay, then we vote no. It's very simple. We said we were going to do the minimum wage. We're going to do the minimum wage. And if you're not going to do the minimum wage in a must-pass bill, you know you can't do it. You know it's going to get filibustered on its own. Don't pretend you're going to do it later. That's not remotely true. We're going to vote on it now. Unfortunately, we cannot find one senator or six congressmen to agree to do that. That's just reality. You know, I got I got two points in the reaction. First of all, kudos uh, to the Young Turks and to the entire community because, in a sense, it's not easy even for those of us who've been covering Congress for years to keep track of the arcane Senate rules and be able to try to understand and explain whether you need 60 or 50 or 51, whatever it is. But for people to be engaged and to realize that yes, you do need, as Jenk was pointing out a while ago, you have to play hardball. That's what politics is all about. And there you have some of the Democrats and and some of the progressives, despite where their hearts are, playing essentially beanbag, and there. 
have Joe Manchin and the Republicans paying hardball. And of course, Joe Manchin and the Republicans are going to win in that scenario. And so, again, there's nothing wrong if you've got a 50-50 deadlock Senate for being a progressive senator, for being a progressive member of the House and saying, okay, I'm going to stand up. And if this thing does not have a raise in the minimum wage, this thing is not getting through. And you can kiss the $1.9 trillion goodbye. Forget about it. Jen, credit to you and to everybody at the Young Turks for getting for getting this point across. The other point, which I found very refreshing in seeing the Van Jones clip, is I don't consider Van Jones to be much of a progressive per se. But to have his voice to be able to articulate the progressive feeling and the split now that exists between progressives and the rest of the party and the danger <laughs> that exists to Democrats going into the 2022 midterms with this, I mean, that voice usually doesn't get represented on a mainstream media platform like CNN or certainly MSNBC. For Van Jones to be able to articulate it and say, here's the problem that we have, I thought was really a very powerful in, in so many ways. And I just I just hope there are more folks over at CNN who are listening to that very point. Yeah, no, you know, and always remember, it's not like he was doing this in fine, I'm fine giving Van Jones credit for saying the right thing and pointing out the reality of the situation. But let's not forget, it's not because he champions this every time. It's not because that's where he always stands. It's because he was forced to. Just like when you force politicians to do certain things, the way that these petitions and these uh, these uh, actions have forced them to even get as far as we've gotten. And that doesn't happen unless there's this grassroots organization, this grassroots level of people speaking out. Before you had online resources and online hosts and, uh, and people actually get a chance to go and have a different source to learn about what's going on and actually talk about what's going on. And you can actually reach your politicians, your pundits. They have no reason to say any of this. They're still inside of a bubble talking about what they experience. They don't even hear about everyone else's lives until they go and campaign, roll up their sleeves and undo their ties and act like they're actually talking to people in the community. That's when they act like they're actually seeing people. During the time when you have to get, we have to legislate before you get reelected, they don't have to speak to many people until they go home for any kind of recess and say, I spoke to the people of Wisconsin and they told me they don't want anything. <laughs> so now the people of Wisconsin can now directly say, hey, I'm from, I don't know, wherever, I'm from Milwaukee and this sucks. You know why this sucks? Because of A, B, C, and D. And you guys need to do something about it. And if enough people do that, they have to then go, I guess I got to point out that I can't just call Bernie Sanders a crazy old man that just does, is disconnected from the American people. The American people are saying it to you. You'd have to ignore them before you could demonize one guy. Now you can't demonize an entire movement of people that are real life and are in your face and can put a camera in front of their own face to let you know how they feel and what they need. Yeah, I'm going to defend Van Jones here, and not just because he gave us a shout out, but because number one, he's one of the few people who ever mentions progressive ideas mm -hmm. on cable news. And and number two, I know he took a lot of heat, but he did help behind the scenes to pass criminal justice reform in the Trump administration. I mean, look at how much trouble we're having past any progressive priorities in the Biden administration. So, and 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 he took a lot of arrows for that. I actually think that that took a lot of courage. And and so, look, and we hold our own accountability here too. And and part of that was not just pressuring Bernie, and it's not just on Bernie. Look, I did a video where I called out the progressives in in Congress too in the House, and it was not. Meant to be malicious, and I clarify that in the video over and over again, because it isn't personal, and I really, really like a lot of those folks. But they do have the power, and they're not using it. And it's my job to tell you the truth. That's the news. And and I asked a thousand times before I went on air. Like there's nothing to to ask, but I quadruple checked. Do they actually have the power? Of course, of course. Six people in, if they vote in the other direction in the House, can block the bill, right? Now, there are other consequences that flow from that. Then you've got to go and negotiate with those eight Democratic senators. So there is some complexity to it, but we're all relatively sophisticated people. We actually had a strategy, and, and some of that strategy, as you can see with your own eyes, worked. And others, other parts of that strategy are built to work. Look at the Kamala Harris part. We then moved on to step two. And we try to pressure Kamala Harris to uh, to go in and actually do her role as presiding chair and rule that it is within reconciliation. And guess what? A great journalist then asked her on the radio, hey, why aren't you overruling the parliamentarian if you want the $15 minimum wage? And then all of a sudden, she was under pressure. That's how it works. There's a strategy that can work, but it requires 
people in Congress to join in. My God, could you imagine if a whole bunch of Congress people or senators started saying, yeah, actually it is on Kamala Harris. She is the presiding chair. Again, that's a fact. There's no question about it, right? And then step three would be to pressure the mansions and the cinemas of the world. And there's a plan for that. And that also involves a lot of people working together all the way from our audience to people who are elected. But in order to do any of that, you've got to actually take action. So I was told by some, definitely not all, that yeah, what I was going to do would be offensive, but accurate. It is everything I'm telling you is true and indisputable. But they say well, would have offended some people. Well, that I then I offended people. Who would it um, offend, Jake? Who would it offend? It would offend the legislators that are not taking action. Yep. It would offend rich people that have access to power and money, and then actually let's say what we believe. You know, that's and then. But in the meantime, where's the question of hey, you guys are offending a large, large majority of the American people? They have no problem offending a large majority of American people. In fact, if they get offended, we're supposed to be concerned about how offended they are while they sit up in their palatial areas and just chill out. But people who can't eat and survive and pay their mortgages, even their rent, those folks offending them, who cares? Offense, you don't get to have any offense to any of this. And well, that's, the, that's the difference we have. I have a question for both JR and Jake here, both of you in this. And that is, Jake, I loved it when you, you know, did the burning bridge video and you talked about how, look, I think progressives, their heart's in the right place, but here's the power that they they have and they're not using. Do you think it's possible, uh, and this doesn't excuse progressives and progressive members or members of Congress, but do you think that perhaps they were suckered to a certain extent by Joe Biden? The extent that when you hear Joe Biden during the campaign speak so emphatically at the debates about $15 minimum wage, if you would have asked anybody back then, okay, if Joe Biden is president and he gets in an office and he's got a COVID relief package, of course, he's going to include a $15 minimum wage. A few weeks ago, when he started to say, well, no, maybe we won't, I was shocked. I was surprised. And then suddenly you have progressives and everybody who supports raising the minimum wage are behind the eight ball. I mean, is that is it fair to say that some of this belongs with Joe Biden and perhaps pulling the wool over so many of our eyes? Yeah, David, that's such a great point, and I'm really glad you brought it up. So, first of all, if you're not in Washington, you cannot understand how thick that bubble is. The minute you enter the Washington bubble, the gaslighting is through the roof. I know for a fact that there are some heroes inside Congress who actually do want to block the bill. But they're being gaslit 24 seven, Oh, you're going to be the bad person, it's your fault. Oh, Don't be ridiculous, of course Biden and Pelosi and, and Schumer want it. They keep saying they want it, of course. We don't ask for a plan, we, we have a plan and it's above your head, right? And these things happen, I, I know for a fact that they happen, okay? And they're happening now. Part of what I'm trying to do is not call out people like, ha ha, I got you. No, that's the exact opposite of what I'm trying. I'm trying to empower them. No, all of us on the outside know that you are right. And the people gaslighting you are wrong. So if you're a progressive legislator, yes, the media will yell at you. I'm not, I never tell pretty little stories about, oh, you know, everybody's gonna throw roses at your feet. No, the media will rise in their rage against you. How dare you? They'll ignore that Manch has been threatening to block the bill for months now, and they'll blame it all on six legislators in the House that say, no, if Manchin and the others are saying no, we're saying no. And they'll pretend it's their problem. I know that. Will every leadership, everybody in leadership in the Democratic Party rain down hell? On anyone who blocks this bill, yes, because you're ruining their plan to pretend to be in favor of the minimum wage, but secretly kill it. They're not your friends. The people on the outside are your friends, your your actual colleagues, your constituents, your voters. And by the way, they do one other trick. They've weaponized their constituents against them. So they say, "Oh, you're threatening COVID relief to your constituents." That's a veiled threat. I'm going to tell the press that you're the one. That it's your fault, and you're you should lose your next election because you delayed this bill. No, look, what happened? I thought the House was in favor of minimum wage. They passed a bill that said they were in favor of minimum wage. Now, when a single person inside Congress says maybe we should insist on that, they go, "How dare you?" Yeah. No, no, we got to empower those heroes, those quiet heroes on the inside. To be able to win those fights 
so that we could actually get a seat at the table and insist on our priorities and not have the conservative corporate Democrats write every single bill. Yeah, my only thought really fast because I want to hear about David Schuster and um and uh, MSNBC, but um uh, um. It's a, it's a simple one line, since we love little snazzy one liners in politics, trust but verify. Since we love to quote Ronald Reagan, and he's this amazing godlike figure, trust but verify, fine, uh, fine, uh, uh, President Biden, in the meantime, candidate Biden. You got a lot to say, great, we're behind you. Let's go ahead and keep track and make sure you do that. That's all there is to it. And if anyone who believed it to a point, fine, I'm okay with that. But the reality is showing us that next time, we're not gonna get fooled anymore to think that it's just gonna automatically happen. Now we have to push you to do it, fine, okay, push it. And my little one more last thought is, I hate whenever Republican talking points will come to a point where they ring true and then Democrats can't say it's it's a reality. So my point being, a lot of times though I say, you know, Democrats always like to say these things to their constituents and they don't do any of that for them anyway because they actually dislike them. Now, whenever that's true, which is in sometimes in this kind of case, the reason they say it is because then that means therefore come to the Republican Party. But in reality, they're openly saying they want nothing to do with any kind of help for you or any kind of representation for what you actually need or want. That's the difference is, is now you have a different outlet. You have a, 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 a group of progressives that you can glom onto and know that they're really saying what the American people really need and want. So the whole argument about Democrats not always doing the right thing for their people is true. But people a lot of times don't, Democrats a lot of times don't want to admit that because then it gives some kind of a talking point to Republicans who are in many cases worse. But in this case, you need another option in order to have an off ramp from that insanity. Yeah, one last quick thing. Um, Look, I also know that some folks in Congress watch the Young Turks and they saw us say that the corporate Democrats were never going to include $15 minimum wage in the bill. Then they heard the Democratic leadership say, swear up and down that they were gonna include it. And then they saw who was right. And then that led to them beginning to think maybe these guys aren't on the level, right? Democratic leadership, because how did the Young Turks know before anybody else knew? And it's not because we had secret information. It's because like I always tell you guys, politics is actually not that complicated. Just show me where the money is and I'll show you exactly how they're gonna vote. Chamber of Commerce said they yeah. don't want an increase in the minimum wage. That's it, it's over. Joe Biden does is not going to go against the Chamber of Commerce. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are not gonna go against the Chamber of Commerce. To this day, if you ask poll Congress, the House, probably 432 out of 435 congressional members would say Nancy Pelosi wants the $15 minimum wage because the bubble is that thick. That's not remotely true. She just knew that Schumer was gonna kill it for her. So that's why she said yes, don't believe the hype. I guarantee you, if Schumer could have passed it in the Senate, Pelosi would have said no. We've covered this shell game for 20 years. If there were a lot more journalists in the country, they everybody could see the shell game with their own eyes. They've done it dozens of times. They always vote with their donors, not at all complicated. Okay, we're we're now short on time, but uh, but David, it's, it's we're not going to be able to do justice to the story. But I did tease it, <laughs> well, and I do want them to hear at least the beginning of it. Like well, here's, the, here's the short version. Sure, the short yeah. version is if people Google this, they say, "Oh, David Schuster um, did a show at CNN, a pilot at CNN, uh, and therefore MSNBC was mad and they got rid of it." Well, actually, what happened is that what was is that we had a contract dispute. I had been verbally promised one thing. They reneged on that. And Jen, you're familiar with how the MSNBC management would often say one thing and then they wouldn't deliver the paper. And so I said, "Okay, well, I've got a year on my contract. If you're not going to honor what you promised, then maybe." Maybe I should look and see what else is out there. And they said, go ahead. So I started looking around and, and I told my bosses and the head of MSNBC, hey, I got an opportunity to talk to CNN. Is this okay? Sure, go ahead, go ahead, find out what, they, what they'll do for you. Then it's like, hey, I think they want to you know, test me out on something. Is this okay? Sure, go for it. All right, so I do that. I shoot a pilot, a couple months pass. They just said, oh, CNN's not, not gonna be interested, whatever, that's fine. But then there's an article in the New York Times about uh, Jonathan Klein, the head of CNN. He doesn't have any fresh ideas. This is 2010, CNN's ratings are terrible. And so somebody at CNN leaks out, Oh, we have some ideas. We just shot a pilot with David Schuster and Michelle Martin. And, and so suddenly MSNBC freaks out because they're, what, you shot a pilot with CNN? Yeah, yeah, remember several months ago when you encouraged me to go ahead and look at what right. I might get from them and so, well, we can't, you can't, you're not allowed to shoot a pilot. Well, you let me do it. 
And so my boss, Phil Griffin, says, but Jeff Zucker's telling me I need to, you know, that this is bad. And, and I'm like, well, Phil, why don't you tell Jeff Zucker what you told me and say, yeah, go ahead and do it and find out. Well, I feels like I can't do that. OK, so they pay me out and get a boatload of money to sort of go away and, and stop bothering MSNBC. Now, to be fair, I had had some issues with MSNBC in the past. I had said things uh, that the management didn't like or that I had, you know called Joe Lieberman a, a hypocrite. He was in charge of Hypocrisy Watch. I had said certain things about uh, Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton trying to twist the votes of uh, superdelegates in 2008. Uh, I used a colloquial word that uh, that management thought I was literally calling Chelsea Clinton. Well, we don't even get into this. But anyway, so I think they saw me as somebody who um, I, I'm very big on. Look, I report like hell. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna let the fact. I'm not gonna let the facts get in get in my way. If management doesn't like you know the reporting, so be it. And I think they thought that they really couldn't control me. And so when they saw an opportunity. Once I was essentially suckered into, yeah, go ahead, do this audition with CNN. And then suddenly it's like, aha, now we have a way to get rid of you. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that. All you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.